Welcome to New West Press Audio, the official podcast of New West Press. We're an independent publishing outfit located in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. My name is Matt Bowes. I'm the general manager here at New West. And with me today is George Bowering, author of the first book of our spring 23 season, uh, Good Morning Poems. Uh, and uh, good afternoon to you, uh, uh, George. How's it going? It's not so bad. What do you? It's, it's morning here. This is a different time zone, you know. <laughs> I know it's a different time zone, but it doesn't quite work that way. You know, uh, so speaking of time, I heard that you were, you first told me that the book was going to be published on the first of April, and I thought after a while, after I did all that work, I thought, wait a minute, is this an elaborate hoax? Is this? <laughs> it's an elaborate uh, grant funded hoax that i've been working at for 10 years yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's uh it's yeah um <laughs> surprise this isn't actually a podcast there's a camera in yeah. your house <laughs> uh <laughs> but uh good morning poems is your yeah. latest uh collection and it is a uh collection of poems that you say are good for reading in the morning uh so it's what English language poetry going back to what the 16th century or so, uh, leading up yeah. to the early 20th? Yep, that's yeah, that's, that how it covers it. And there yeah. are, I believe, 48, which is one of my favorite numbers, uh, 48 poems and 48 essays, and therefore 48 poets or 49 if you count me. Yeah, so each uh, each poem is about a page long, and then yeah. on the following page, you have an essay. Uh, often very different sorts of looks at each sort of book. Like it's not yeah. always structural analysis or textual. You have you have all different kinds of ways of looking at these. Uh, yeah. But you say in the collection that the best time to read poetry is right in the morning. So do you want to let us know about that? How, how did you get into that habit? Um, well, I don't know. I, I tried a lot of different things. Like some people like to go for a walk or a hike or something like that. Some people just sit down with a cup of coffee and read the New York Times, <laughs> do the crossword puzzle. And, I, you know, and I've tried many of those things. Um, and then I guess it was sort of an accident one time. I was just sitting there. I can't even remember what the book was, but I was just sitting there and I picked up a book and I read a poem out loud, mm. as you're supposed to. And and it set the day. It set, I don't know. I can't say that it made me happy that day or that I felt more poetic than usual that day but mm -hmm. it cleared it that's what poetry does it it clears things for you hmm. yeah so uh you know kind of get your your head in order before going on to your day so yeah. do you do you not drink coffee then is it is this what wakes you up <laughs> you know what I used to follow my family's tradition of drinking 15 cups of coffee a day mm -hmm. but uh, now I drink one maybe two um like uh, all us old guys <laughs> yeah and uh, no and and it's it's kind of nice to drink coffee while you're reading poetry yeah eat a scone yeah. too that's a nice little afternoon a oh, oh, morning nice yeah. little morning uh ritual to get into well morning has different meanings for different people for me morning means you know like 10 30 mm. <laughs> i wish um <laughs> So when did you get into the habit and how long, like, do you do it every single day? Yep. And uh, I, I read poetry other parts of the day, too. In fact, I probably read, I read more poetry than anything else, I guess. Although I do read an awful lot of fiction, nonfiction, uh, criticism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm finding it, uh, I'm going through a different experience now in that, uh, I'm, I'm, my eyesight is failing me being an old, mm -hmm. being, I'm an old guy. And so I'm beginning to do a lot of my reading via machine that mm -hmm. reads for me and reads out loud. Um, and sometimes that doesn't work all that well with poetry because uh, if you, if you're dealing with an American machine or one of the American, one of the machines that does that, they have this uh, voice, usually a female voice, that reads, um, that's a machine reading, and it's one heck of a lot better than it was 20 years ago, mm -hmm. but still, it still doesn't observe what, you know, like, when I'm writing a poem, I'm, the poem is directing me how to write it, and then I'm helping the poem direct the reader how to hear it, and uh, she's not hearing it, she's mm -hmm. just it's sort of mechanical so there's a bit of a, a problem with that um so i sometimes i still try i can still if the print's big enough i can still read 
And I and there are some poems that I would just love reading over and over and over again. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I get a kick out of one of the uh, apps we use to look at our uh, eBooks. It's called Thorium. And it does that speech to text, uh, the text to speech thing. And it reads it to you. And you could give it, you could give the English accent different intonations. So if you want it to be like an Indian person reading English or yeah. an Irish person, but yeah. it doesn't, it, it'll never understand the sort of the pauses and the, the places you have to put uh, kind of yeah. a little bit of extra emphasis on, like it, it's a robot. It, it This is the one thing we do is that we're able to feel things, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, artificial intelligence uh, is not your best friend, but there are, um, and they don't do an awful lot of poetry compared to other things. Uh, n- not very much poetry is really offered as far as I've found out so far. Mm-hmm. Uh, but right now I'm reading, um, um, or is, I'm having read to me uh, Charles Bernstein's uh, collection of, um, of pieces about poetry called The Pitch of Poetry. And uh, it's read by one of these robots. <laughs> mm. So when it comes to the poetry, I, I, hear, I hear, I know what it's supposed to sound like because I know, mm. most, I know most of the poetry that, they're, that they're, he's talking about. Has the robot ever given you a different feeling than you were supposed to? Like, has its weird voice actually given a poem a different meaning before? You know, if I were somebody like, uh, if I were re- truly an experimental poetry, I would try to write um, specifically for the robot voice, having become familiar with it, and see what that does, and see what mm-hmm. changes, and, and and this the sort of thing like people doing mm, concrete poetry or sound poetry or or yeah, <laughs> you know, <laughs> flarf poetry or whatever. Mm-hmm. I, can't, I can't remember what flarf was. <laughs> Uh, Doug, Doug would have remembered, yeah. yeah. Doug, I think I think Doug would actually be really interested in like AI poetry too, huh? Doug Barber, uh, former yeah. president of New West, and you know, yeah. you knew him, you knew him forever. But uh, it it does have a sort of meter and voice to it. It's just a weird robot one. But yeah, someone could work around that yeah. and try and collaborate. Someone could collaborate with Chat GPT or something. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> there, there, that that's your next book. You could you and the robot could yeah. become friends. I know that once uh, Charles Olson once said that um, when he got when a proofreader uh, or when somebody made a mistake in the typesetting and that there was a typo, he went with the typo as a possible opening. Mm. It might be telling him something because because you're you're listening. Like the, the main thing that a poet does is listen, right? And he's he's mm-hmm. hearing and he's writing down what he's hearing, and uh, and and if he gets to see something that has been done in a, in a, by a person making a mistake, a, a type typesetting. Yeah. Um, he should be just as attentive. And and he actually also has uh, published a couple of poems in which you can see where he did exactly that, where he hmm. the poem was led in a direction in which he was out of control or he hmm. was, you know, attending to it. And uh, a good lesson, I think. That reminds me of uh, proofreading our audiobooks sometimes because the readers will often insert contractions into speech and stuff. And, you know, unless you're writing Shakespeare or something where the character's words have to be in the specific uh, tone and cadence, if it's just normal speech, like the, the shortening it down kind of makes sense. And Mm-hmm. You, when you're listening, you, it kind of glosses over because it just sounds like normal conversation to you. So, yeah, sometimes those little errors actually maybe don't help the product, but could change it into a different uh, dimension. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and then she should be open to all those things, um, not to you know make, may, may, maybe just for fun sometimes, but one should always be open to that sort of thing uh, mm-hmm. because. It teaches you that the poet is not in control. The poet mm-hmm. is not, the, you know, the per- poet is a person who's like <laughs> listening desperately to hear what it, the poem's going to say, and uh, and so he shouldn't. He, I used to really, really dislike the poetry reviewers who said things such as, "This poet was not in control of his materials." <laughs> I'd say, mm-hmm. "Yeah, well, yeah, <laughs> yeah." 
<laughs> well, I mean, everyone likes to invoke the muses, and maybe this is yeah. the way that they get back to you and say, like, oh, maybe this word sounds better. And it's just a happy accident. Yeah, well, there are a lot of poems that are written by controlled accidents, but or by not controlled accidents, but by accidents that are set off by some some technique, right? Mm -hmm. uh, like a roll of the dice, for instance, to use a famous French example. Mm -hmm. um, and I and I'm 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 fully fully in favor of that. Much I'm much more in favor of that than I'm in favor of say trying to write like like Robert Frost. <laughs> mm -hmm. So when you when you get up in the morning and read your poem, I'm assuming you don't uh, uh, automatically just bust out an essay too, right? Like it's it's not that's not part of the process. It's probably more over the course of years and thinking about these things and returning to them is where you make your arguments. But how does that ha half of the book work uh, well, in yeah. your schedule? Yeah, it was actually. I'll, I'll give you a little piece of history to explain that the, the way it started. It started with well, like Gene and I have often had things like um, book clubs. We're running. We have a book club going now. Um, Gene's book club, it's called. <laughs> and uh, and and um, what do you call it when you? Oh, a potluck potluck mm -hmm. dinner. So we had potluck dinners, and and then we thought, hey, why don't we have a combination potluck and reading club only instead of books have it be single poems so that's what we did so i um we would pick a poem i would write a piece about it and you're right it would be a, a different approach each time depending on what i thought was oh what struck me uh, which is a good term what struck me is like being hit by a muse right Pow, take mm -hmm. that. and uh about that and then um we asked the people to bring the food that they brought for the potluck should have something to do uh, with the poem that we're doing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you know, the famous, you know, about Keats's grave where it says here lies one who his name was writ on water. Right. So, yeah. uh, so a friend of ours who's a novelist, Kevin Chong, um, he got to make, he got to make some jello that was water colored uh, i.e. you could just about see through it it was that watercolor and then um, some other jello that cut out the letters that spell the name Keats and mm -hmm. it, and they the, laid them on top of the water jello and yeah. that, was, that was one of the desserts for that dinner so uh, we didn't do uh, that poem because it's only a little you know short graveyard poem <laughs> yeah <laughs> but uh, that's what that's the sort of thing that we did um and um like gene always points out uh one of our one of our friends uh david farwell always found some reason to make a connection between his meatloaf and whatever the poem was that we were doing <laughs> <laughs> that week <laughs> what sort of qualifications did a meatloaf, meatloaf poem have <laughs> yeah, was right. there was there any sort of uh texture or you know did no, the I language think, have to have anything in order for it to be especially meat meatball worthy? Well, David was from the, was from the East Coast, so you never know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he'll figure out a way to 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 meet love it. Yeah. Anyway, they were they were always really good, and we and we have his famous. We he died a couple of years ago, and we now are in possession of his of his meatloaf dish. <laughs> mm. So are there any poems that you enjoy reading, but you would never write about? Is there just some that's just for fun, just for enjoyment, and that you don't really want to delve into too much of the craft behind, or is everything up for grabs? Um, uh, it's a hard question. I guess I think probably I'm really, I really love the, the so-called uh, American songbook. Um, I really like uh, standard, good old standard songs like, like I took a trip on a train and I thought about you, right? mm -hmm. and and some of them are just it's just beautiful, wonderful, wonderful uses of end rhyme of all things, um, and but then there's another there's they go the other direction as well, like, um, which there's a famous poem about New England that doesn't have any end rhyme at all, uh, like wait a minute it's. Um, no, I can't even remember what it is now, but it was a very, very popular song. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, it goes. Oh, Moonlight in Vermont. Mm -hmm. uh, people, I don't. I think people 
sing that song or or listen to it or hear it in their heads and don't even realize that there's no end rhyme except that at the end of each verse there's a um there's a, they say moonlight in vermont right mm -hmm. but, yeah it's a beautiful beautiful wonderful poem and a, a terrific song so I, I think um there are some poems in which you you delight in the sound just for because it's so pleasant. There's other poems in which you're you're interested in the accuracy of the song. Like did, he, did that sounds exactly right. There are other ones in which you can't stand it. It's awful, but mm -hmm. it's it's what had to be. Right? And then there's the you know hundreds of, most most if you pick up any normal poetry magazine or any other magazine. Um, most of the stuff in there is substandard. It's it's you know not very mm -hmm. good, and you're not likely to find a poem that will be around for a hundred years um, in a copy of a magazine that you pick up. But <laughs> but there have been poems that have just just told you what it was to live and die at that moment in the middle of that century. And mm -hmm. uh, you're so glad that they're there, and you're glad that somebody saved them, and really glad that they invented the printing press. Yeah. <laughs> Were there any poem poems and poets that, while working on the collection, sort of rose in your estimation, and by that token, some that fell? Like, were there some that you thought about, mm -hmm. like thinking about them more, you just appreciated them more, or you didn't? Um, yeah, for instance. Uh, Francis Ellen Watkins Harper, who uh, wrote a wonderful poem called The Slave Auction. She is a, a terrific uh, uh, Black American poet of the of the middle 19th century. And um, it's towards the end of the 19th century. And uh, the poem is, is, as you would expect, regular in its rhyme and regular in its meter and so forth. But the... Uh, can you imagine the emotion? Can you imagine being a, a, a woman after hundreds yeah. of years of American slavery, um, actually seeing little kids being sold at slave auction, separate from their parents being sold at slave auction, and managing mm. to turn that the horror of that and the pain of that into a poem? Um, and she, yeah, she knocked me out. And I don't think she's uh, she's not as great a lyricist as say uh, uh, Wallace Stevens. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. uh, but for that reason, um, I was really struck by her. And she's kind of under discussed too, right? Oh yeah, she is. Um, and as <laughs> as most African American poets have been, and uh, yeah. Uh, but thing that that's changing as well. It's, um, there's you know you're much much more likely to run into. Uh, African American writing now than you were mm. as a kid. Yeah, that's for sure. Does anyone kind of who was really highly rated when you were going to school have they kind of disappeared? Is there anyone you can conjure from the mists of memory? Yeah, depending who they were rated by. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this it happened. Um, the curious thing happened. Like I'm really, really old, so I have seen. I have seen poets disappear after their death um, mm -hmm. in Canada. They may come back, and I don't know. Um, and poets who um, get even more famous after they've died. So you take these two friends, Irving Layton, who was one one time promoted in Montreal as like the great Canadian poet. Mm -hmm. I've never, I haven't heard his name mentioned in the last fifteen years. On the other hand, his young friend Leonard Cohen. Um, yeah more popular now than he was when he was alive so <laughs> he's still putting out a book every year i don't know how he does it it's amazing <laughs> yeah. yeah and not only that but uh music and drawings and and uh yeah, and, yeah it's amazing <laughs> yeah he's, he's a prolific guy <laughs> yeah um so you've uh you got a sample from the book for our listeners uh so why don't you set that up for us Okay, well, uh, what I'll do is what I thought when you mentioned that there are some poems in here that I, I like enormously, and other ones that well, okay, I don't like all that much. Like for instance, I'm famous for not liking uh, Ro uh, Robert Frost, <laughs> mm -hmm. but um, I was brought up in a time when learning poetry 
the standard was more or less the, no, if you don't count Shakespeare, the standard is more or less the romantics. And so it was Keats and Byron and Wordsworth and Coleridge and so forth. And my favorite poet of all time is uh, is Shelley. I know I'll read this and then I'll read the, I was just going to explain it. And I thought, wait a minute, I've already explained it here. <laughs> oh, by the way, I one of the ideas I had, and then I thought, no, it, it's too difficult to do, would be to have one page for the poem, another page for my little piece on it, and then a third page for the reader's attempt mm. to say something about either of those two things. You'll need a four-dimensional book to do that. Yeah, that's the trouble. <laughs> Oread. Whirl up sea, whirl your pointed pines, splash your great pines on our rocks, hurl your green over us, cover us with your pools of fur. What she has to do then is, how come the poem is a title after one kind of muse, but is addressed to a different kind. Of. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, there's uh, often a disconnect <laughs> or some interplay between the title and the first yeah. lines of the poem, because it, it kind of is the first line of the poem, the title. Some people take advantage of that, some people don't. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Here goes my little quote, essay, unquote. This is my favorite Imagist poem. But if you were to remove its images and recite it with sounds only, you would get a lot of what the poem is, quote, about. Try it. The poem comprises six short lines, and five of them begin with an imperative verbs. If you take your time between each line, you can almost hear and therefore see the sea in waves crashing against the rocks at the edge. It must be a constant action as the last word of the last line rhymes with the first word of the first line. There is, in fact, a lot of rhyme going on in whirl, rhymes with another whirl, and then with hurl, and before calming down with fur, there is also a lot of front rhyme from such a short poem, the pointed pines touching lightly like smaller wave on the, I'm sorry, on the second letter of splash before reappearing in pines, then resting calmly in those pools. But there is subtlety here as the phoneme R, which in English is not a consonant, comes on us quietly 13 times in 26 short words. One could go on even though the point is over so quickly, noticing that the letter C, hmm, C, S E A, hmm, turns over, oh, turns <laughs> over us into cover us. All right, but isn't there a lot to be said about the way HD titles the poem after the nymph that we, I'm really having trouble here, but I know what, uh, part of the borrowing reading a poem thing is borrowing reading the poem when he's blind, right? So that should be pretty thrilling for any audience. <laughs> just, like, just like Homer. Yeah, exactly. Or, yeah, or Milton. Oh, no, no, Homer. <laughs> All right. But isn't there to be said, something said to me about the way H.D. titles the poem? After the nymph that we associate with conifer forests, then addresses the sea, where one might expect nereids. Then offers an image of large seagoing conifers, then asks, as a plural, to be inundated by pools of fur. And the first question I then asked was, who is us? And it covers us with your pools of fur. 
who are us? I mean, that's the main question of any poll, really. Who, a lot of people who, think, oh, I think that. I'm sorry about making such a mess, but that's about the best I can read out loud now. Oh, no problem. Unless I've got big, big, big print in front of me. But mm -hmm. um, you see that um, that's the way I would approach that poem, but in that whole business about, about, imagine, like how many people reading that noticed that of that of the 26 words, 13 of them got, have the sound R in them. And how many people know that in English R is not a consonant? It's a it's a vowel. Because mm -hmm. in all the other European languages, it's a consonant. In in Italian, in Spanish, Dutch, German, mm -hmm. it's a consonant. Because a consonant is made when you touch one part of your mouth with another part of your mouth. But when you use an R in English, unless you happen to be some kind of snotty Englishman, <laughs> you mm -hmm. don't. It's in, in American or Canadian English, an R is just made with sound coming out of a mouth with nothing touching, just like an A or an E or an I or an O. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's a lot going on in 26 words. Yeah. <laughs> I could have written, I could have done what I've done a couple of times. I once took a, I once took a poem by Margaret Atwood that it's about 18 words and wrote a 30 page essay about it. Did she ever read it? <laughs> oh, I imagine so. <laughs> <laughs> huh. yeah. so that was a preview from george bowering's new book good morning poems it's going to be on sale in stores and online right away basically as soon as you're hearing this you should be able to pick it up so check it out on our website at, or at your friendly local bookstore uh thank you very much for coming on the show george i'm really glad to be here and remember every time you pick up this book say good morning poems <laughs> yeah just say hi to them that's they're, yeah. they're 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 morning poems that are good and you're also saying good morning to them there's there's a lot going on in three words there uh <laughs> but uh yeah uh thanks again again for listening and we'll see you on the next episode